Okay, I will go ahead and call this meeting to order. It is 6.03. Um, we thank you all for being here. Uh, we do indeed have a quorum of five board members. I'm hopeful that we may have some late arrivals to, to get us even beefier. Um, the purpose of the meeting tonight boiled down to just a couple things because of course we have a full agenda um, monitoring and feasibility study thank you for all of the guests who are here tonight he says well um, are there any edits that anyone has to propose to the agenda great agenda is accepted we shall move on to the ownership linkage section that brings us to public comment hi Ann um, the board welcomes comments but is not able to take any action on them other than to direct the public to the appropriate staff member or to the complaint procedure. Comments are limited to three minutes per speaker. Time may not be ceded to another speaker. Comments are to be addressed to me, the board chair, or the board as a whole, not to any individual on the board, on the staff, or in the public. Please raise your hand and wait to speak until you are asked to by the chair. Please identify yourself with your first and last name and your town of residence. Please refrain from restating comments that have already been shared, although you are welcome to express agreement with those comments. Order and decorum shall be observed by everyone. Shouting and profanity are prohibited. As the board chair, I will maintain the order and decorum of the meeting. With that, I do open things up for public comment. Online, anyone? I'm hoping you can hear us. Maybe I can get a, a confirmation from someone online just to make sure. I can definitely see that the mic is picking up. Great. Little, so I'll stop shouting. <laughs> All right. All right, I'm calling it five, four, three, two, one. Moving on. Um, report out from subcommittees. So starting with the ends, Emil, would you like to give a brief? Yeah, I'm happy report to report. So we have met twice since our last board meeting. I was actually thinking as I read through the packet that October was a pretty busy month. Um, and we actually, our last meeting, thank you to Rachel Fish, it felt like kind of the dam got unclogged and we got some really great work done in the last 15 minutes of the meeting. Yep. We're meeting again in early December and um, we are hoping to have a draft uh, for first read at our December meeting. So we've made some tweaks to our end statement and um, sort of the structure of the ENDS report, and we're getting closer, so. Yeehaw. Thank you. Um, any questions from anyone not on the ENDS committee for the ENDS committee? Okay. Work progresses. Um, ownership linkage. So we're coming into the holidays and feel like a letter to the community would be good. Um, so we're working on that, highlighting uh, kind of things that have happened thus far this year. Take any feedback from the rest of the board. I'm just going to ask Michael to give us some insight on, on what we think should be highlighted, and we'll have a draft of that for next meeting. Great. Um, I would recommend that that process be as quick as possible only because the annual report is something that we're going to be talking about tonight and that mm -hmm. contains a letter uh, technically from me but really from from the whole board um, <clears throat> so of course repetitiveness is fine we can say similar things and get and it has a different reach but I would keep that in mind yeah. okay well we're intending to do essentially a summary of the agendas from the last few months so uh, that can be a pretty quick turnaround in terms of the content so absolutely great so um, as a point of action and I'll remind at the end of the meeting um, for board members to contact <clears throat> um, 
either member. Did you join that committee? No, you joined the ends committee. Yep. Is it still just the two of you? Mm -hmm. Okay, Which not just. We're fine it's still with, by the way. The, the whole of the two of you? Um, okay. Uh, ownership linkage. All right, thank you. Um, annual report to voters. Ah, oh, what a segue. Um, so, Michael, you want to take this one? Because this is yeah, kind of... we work with, uh, with Ben Merrill. Uh, we've worked on that for a number of years. And uh, Ben reached out, boy, pretty pretty early in my in my time. And uh, he asked me if we were going to keep, keep doing that. And I said, you bet. So then... Just recently, I've talked with I've talked with Ben through Kyle, and uh, you know, some of the question was, are we going to do anything different with the report and the and the whatnot? And my expectation was that I didn't think so. I thought we would we've had success with the report the way that it's been, and that we would maintain that. Uh, I've been working with the principals to make sure that each of their letters is is ready to go. Uh, my letter is in a very rough drafty kind of format. Uh, but December is the, I think, is the timeline that he's looking for more action to start happening with that, so. Um, and technically, the report side of things, other than the letters, the report is the, this is what we're asking the voters for. Yes. Right, so that's informed by the budget. That's informed by the budget well, and the decision yeah. that's going on here, and yes, yep. Michael, can you give me a little bit more context to remind me who Ben Merrill is? Uh, ben Merrill is a media person. Thank you. Who, That's okay, good enough. Thank you. Thank you. He was on staff here for a while. Now he's he kind of contract out because he's a beautiful writer, among other things. But he, he helps us write so public documents a lot. <clears throat> OK, here's a biggie, the budget discussion. Yeah. Take it away, Michael. So, the budget discussion. When you look at the packet that this, we, we sent this to you electronically, but Kyle also just gave it to you in the paper format, it's at the very end, right? And so, the way I see it is you are going to approve three different budgets. Um, and one of them goes to the, one of those budgets goes to the voters. So I'm going to start with the easy, the easiest one, uh, and that's the Raven budget. That's at the and right towards the end. It's at kind of like page three, right? This one. Yep. So we're starting with the middle. That okay. Is. Right. Right at the very it's beginning. Raven. Yep. Up at the top. It up at the top looks like this. It says orange oh. southwest, and then oh, Raven right southwest. underneath. It's it. the third sheet of paper in your packet. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. okay. Yes. Thank you. So what you're going to hear tonight is that essentially the way we went about working the budget is as a full administrative team. And then the administrative team went back to folks within their buildings. And then they came back and had a meeting with Heather, me, uh, Robin and Kayla joined most of those as well, uh, so that we were talking about what were what were we looking at in Raven in particular, since that's the one we're on. Uh, you're looking. What I usually do when I look at a budget is I jump down to the bottom, right? Cut right to the chase and say, "What's going on here?" Uh, and so with Raven you'll see that the total budget is projected to be down by 2.64%. <coughs> so what you're looking at in this particular budget is what I would call a level service budget. So whatever we're doing this year, whatever was in the budget for this year is in the budget. We rolled over those positions, the people, with an estimate of what the increase uh, might be. We don't have a contract, so we, we're taking our best shot at what, what, that, what we might negotiate. 
Uh, we do know that health insurance is 11.9%. So health insurance is accurate, assuming that the same staffing comes back and selects the same plans. So again, always a guess. One of the things as a superintendent that I like to remind the boards is here we are in November and the money that we're going to approve in January, we actually won't even start spending it until July 1st, right? And we'll finish spending it a year and a half from today or when we approve it. So a lot can happen in, those, in that time. Uh, but that's essentially the gist of the Raven budget. It's level service and the result of that is it'll be down 2.64%. Two two uh, again, rough draft here, so I would expect some small changes perhaps between now and the next time, but what your job, what I see the board's job tonight is, is to say, hey Michael, yes, you're in the ballpark of what the voters will think are acceptable, what we think's acceptable, uh, where the owners are, and what, what, needs, what needs to happen. So tonight is designed, that it's a short amount of time for me to talk about three budgets, and it's designed for me to stay at a high level with it. So, okay, I'm guessing that a, a decrease of 2.64% is an acceptable budget. This one is, there's probably not a lot to talk about. I think most of that, most of that's being driven uh, by the change in salaries. Most of that savings is gonna be, be coming along there. Uh, we did, however, our enrollment in the Raven program has typically been budgeted at 10 students. Mm -hmm. You'll see that we bumped that down to nine. We're not at 10 right at the moment. We're a little, we're a little bit less. And the Raven program operates, it's supposed to be a break-even program so that uh, we don't make money with Raven, but we don't lose money with Raven. So from a budget standpoint, we projected that we would only have nine students, which will cause the tuition for that uh, to be $30,000 next year, up from 28 this year, which represents uh, eight and three quarter percent increase, give or take. Okay. Happy to answer questions about Raven if you have them. Again, I'm just I, curious, uh, any idea what's driving, is it just the general decline in enrollment that's driving the, because the, I'm did, noticing the enrollment, or at least are these, this is budgeted, so we don't, I don't see We didn't have 10 last year either or the year before. Oh, okay. It's a high needs program. We right. generally have between seven and, and 10, okay. but seven oh. is, more yeah because i'm seeing with what we've been enrolling was, there was like 14. we might have eight this year 14 yeah. so we're budgeted for before that so so enrollment hasn't been which is actually a good thing right you yeah know. yeah no that's and a we're good budgeting thing. closer to what it sounds like reality yes. has trended yeah yes yeah. so just to clarify here um the salary for the teacher the one FDE was 92,000. Yes. That's going down to 78. Is that just because we're hiring a new person with less experience? We did hire a new person. Okay. So that, that was a position that we <clears throat> built the budget last year. Yeah. Remember, you're way far ahead. Yes, thank and you. And so it was built with the old Got it. with the old salary, <clears throat> and now it's built with the current person in it. Good. And not necessarily person. experience, but also <clears throat> step and all of that stuff. You know, yeah. The right. scale. Yeah. It's, it, yes. Okay. Excellent. Looks good. We like a decrease. That's <laughs> why well, I started with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh oh, okay. I, Where I, are we going next? I needed to get myself warmed up a little bit. <laughs> and it looks like we're just anticipating an increase in cost of electricity. Yeah, we, mm -hmm. we actually, uh, <laughs> I'm really impressed with the way that electric fuel, those kinds of things, you have a great facilities. <laughs> Uh, leadership uh, because they actually went out they studied they came back and they said here we're going to do this one by this amount this one by less than that amount and they actually looked at market conditions and said this is what it's gonna this is what it's gonna be it's the first time I've ever been in a district that did that we just said inflation cost of it's gonna be this but these guys have the numbers behind it to support it it was really cool to have that conversation with them 
So, okay. Thank you. Moving on to RTCC. Right. <laughs> I think this one's in the back. Let me see what, what it looks like. Looks like I think this. it is in the back, yeah. Mm. Hold the back here. Yeah. yeah. No, I think it's in the back. Maybe this one here. Up yeah. At, yeah, up at the top, it's going to say the Randolph Technical Career Expenditures, and it'll have the. Mm -hmm. So this one is um, one, two, three, four, five from the end. Five pages in, yep. <laughs> Okay. So at a high level, again, this time I'm going to, yep. I'm going to jump down and you're going to see a 1.36% increase on this one. Again, sounds really great. Uh, but this one I've got a, I got a little bit of work to do with you to make sure you understand what's mm. happening here. So at the RAB board last week, we made the decision to remove the dental program, then low enrolled, uh, and the RAP supported that. You ultimately set the budget, so ultimately it's you when you support this budget that's gonna be supporting a RIF in that position. Uh, and then we're putting the education uh, program on hold. So we'll have another RIF for the person that's affected by that position reduction. That's what's driving this. So what's going on here is the dental program and the education program are very, they have a very low enrollment. Um, the two combined have less than five kids. Okay. And so we've worked with the state, we've got permission to do that. Uh, there was some challenge with the dental program. It was a program that I uh, tried to get up and going, I think it was three or four years ago, and it has not taken off. Initially, that was removed from the budget last year, actually, and, um, and then the state said, well, if you don't run that program, you're going to have to pay back. It was pretty much the salary in grants. So we ran it one more, we ran it one more year, and now we're at the spot where we won't have to pay back the grants that got it up and going, okay? Um, I think there's probably some, I, I think there's gonna be some more work going on here because as much as you appreciate an expenditure budget that's only up 1.36% and 1.31 after federal funds come into it, what that does not take into account is the other side of the equation, which you know from the timeline that you're not gonna get the real in-depth version of that until next, next meeting. But I'm gonna prep you for it a little tonight. So the way that a tech center works is enrollment is determined by the previous six semester average of enrollment. And what's happening with our tech center enrollment is it's been up in the high 120s, 130s for quite some time. And now it's been coming down. So last year it was less than that, both semesters. And right now it's at like 108 kids enrolled. So when you calculate tuition, you take the expenditures and you divide it by the uh, number of students to get a cost per pupil or tuition in this case, since it's a tech center. And the challenge that we're, that we're gonna be looking at is with the six semester average, our tuition rate next year will be in the 25,000-ish per student range. Not terrible, it's up in about the 7% range. Okay, uh, and I'm talking really rangy here because we don't have those, those enrollment numbers. If we took this budget and used the 108 students that it is actually supporting, we're up over 29,900 per student. Okay, that's not how it's gonna get calculated, but I just think it's important for the board to know that based on the number of students with the actual cost with this budget, is more like 29.9 a student, okay? And that's gonna catch up to us because what's happening is 
our tuition or our, our enrollment numbers are inflated, which is helping our tuition rate stay deflated. But what will happen even if we start growing the enrollment numbers is we're going to have some years for the next few years where enrollment has been low, so our six semester average will be lower. In fact, so we're going to be, we've had, right now, I guess I'd describe it as we've got a tailwind with our enrollment numbers, and we're headed into a headwind with our enrollment numbers. It's, I think what we're focused on in the technical center is how do we, how do we create fun, run programs that kids want to participate in. Okay. There's a caveat if we could increase the if we could increase the uh, enrollment numbers by 20 plus percent in any one year, then we can switch directly from that six semester average to what's called actual and actually use our actual number. But a quick quick numbers here, right? 22 kids is what that program would have to increase by. And it's interesting because, going back a little further in the history, I think we could say that the Technical Center operated for quite some time at 150 students. But what's happened to population in Vermont high schools is that they have it's decreased. I think that I've talked to people about what the Randolph, uh, what this building held in it, and I've had people tell me seven, 700 kids not so long ago. And same thing in Northfield and Williamstown and down in White River Valley. Plus, I think the other thing that uh, you need to remember about the Technical Center is it used to serve seven high schools, and now it's serving four. Whitcomb closed, uh, Rochester closed, and Chelsea closed. And Chelsea and Humber, or Chelsea and Rochester are choosing to have school choice. And my understanding, talking with the superintendent from White River Valley, is those kids are going to schools that are outside of our technical center's catchment area. Okay? So I think that's kind of the, I think it's kind of the interesting thing. Um, so, so right to write the headwinds. You say it, we would need to increase by 22, or is it? Yeah. I, I, it's a great question. Sam. Is it so 30? I, I'm just got 36 in my head here, just on the difference. So what what would need to happen is if we could get 20, if we could get a 20 percent increase in our students, we wouldn't be we wouldn't need to work off of a six semester average. Oh, okay. Right? Gotcha. And instead, we can work on. The actual, actual got it. The actual number. Okay. So you you are right that to get into the into the mid one thirties we yeah. need more than twenty two. Yeah. Okay. But I think the RAP is looking at uh, it's got to look at programs and where we're at because right now half of the programs have less than the eight kids that allow them to be Perkins funded. So there's work that has to happen. All right. So I think part of the direction that I'm going to be looking for from the board here is I'm showing you numbers that look good. I'm showing you tuition numbers that look good. But next year, they're going to, the bottom is going to fall out of that. And so I want you to know that. And I think as a board, the direction that you're going to need to help me with is do we let that happen or do we create a glide path to that? And in order to create a glide path for that, I'd have to look at this budget and say, are there some more reductions that we need to that we need to look at? Okay. And I'll just remind all board members, even if you aren't sitting on the RAB, that you are welcome to attend those meetings. They're quarterly. <laughs> I'm gonna give you the uh, why don't I give you the OSSD budget? And then I'll be quiet for a little bit and <laughs> listen to what you all think where we're at. Okay? 
which I think is also for to the end. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, there's, it seems to be one page right at the beginning that is expenditures, and then the, uh, the last because two one, pages of the packet. One's the financial, and one's the mixture budget. Yes. So Perfect. the one at the beginning is the financial, the one at the end is includes mixture. Yeah. Thank you. Okay? Yes. All right, this was fun, I have to tell you. <laughs> and I have to I have to recalibrate oh. <laughs> because well I'm used to work Hold on. Yeah. I am not seeing it. You're looking it should say draft one budget like the other ones, right? No, it says Orange Southwest School District expenditures oh. and it's at the end. And it has just expenditures. <clears throat> yep. Okay. But no draft budget written anywhere. That's what was confusing me. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying, Ann. Yep. And it but it has twenty okay. it has twenty five twenty has a column of twenty five twenty six. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. I no. think the budgets are all at the beginning. Oh, it's, um, the proposed budgets at the beginning. And is it at the beginning? No. At the end. Okay. All right. Oh, is it back at the beginning? Uh, all right, yes, so right. yeah. page two okay. of the packet. Yeah. Includes right. 25, 26 draft <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. That's no, no. okay. We're good. We're back. You got it? Yep. So this was fun for me because, well, I'm used to my supervisory union that I worked in having a budget that's similar to what uh, Orange Southwest is. I It was broken into four different budgets. So suddenly I'm looking at Robin. This four hundred thousand dollar increase. Are you sure that's only eight percent? And it took me until that moment to realize. Oh yeah, of course it's only that because it's everything. So pretty, pretty neat. But again, same thing as the rest of them. What he did with this budget to actually maybe to set it up before I go right to the second page of it is again it's a level service budget ish. And here's what the ish part of that is. So again, you approved a budget last year in the, in the winter, and then there were savings, there were different things, and so throughout the spring, there was some need for different positions, some support staff and whatnot. Those were able to be funded, the money was in the budget for those positions, and so, but the positions weren't in. So if I had a true, complete rollover from budget to budget, this would look different. It's a level service budget from where we are right now, just like the rest of them, but in this one, it really matters that you understand that. That this budget has positions in it that weren't in last year's budget, okay? And it has people in it that are hired at a lower rate than what last year's budget thought we were going to have. Okay? And so you look at what happens with this as a level service budget running forward, it's a 10.51% increase. And after federal funds come in, it's uh, estimated to be just about a 10, little bit more than a 10% increase. So again, had to make the same, this one was a little, this one's trickier in that there's a lot more staffing and we don't have a contract, so there's an estimate in there for, for what, where we're gonna be with that. Health insurance, same as before, the 11.9, we know that, that's gonna, that's gonna be there. Dental's level. Uh, the two changes to this budget are under Act 166, that's the universal pre-K law, we have a new pre-K that is slated to come in and have a lot of seats available in it. And it's attached to a child care center so that there could be people who choose to send their children to that center. So we have increased our enrollment for universal pre-K by a little bit here. Uh, and we had been talking, you've been talking for a number of years about going to a five day a week pre-K. We may not be in the position to do that. So we're, we're still looking at it, but the money to go into a five day a week pre-K is in the budget. But if the enrollment in that new center becomes really big, there's just this 
there's a, it's up in the air at the moment. So I think for you to know that is important. Um, I won't, I'll get into the next meeting, what the shifts are exactly and what not, because I'm running over already, uh, and Robin will be here at the next meeting. But um, essentially what's happened is uh, there have been some positions with enrollment going down that also weren't filled. So it's not only savings in hires, it's savings in positions that didn't need to be filled and you're still able to meet your class size policy. Okay. The last little piece that got added into this budget at the moment is we're looking at, we have a data management manager position in the budget at six or a 0.6 FTE and we're looking to push that to full time. So a point four of a data managing position. That data management position, what's going on right now is we, the state has over the last seven, eight years has really changed how it collects data. So when I first started out as an administrator, uh, high school principal, I wrote on a piece of paper that looked an awful lot like this, BFA Fairfax High School, ninth grade, this many kids, 10th grade, this many kids, 11th grade, this many kids, 12th grade, this many kids. I signed it and I sent it to the state and that's how they collected my numbers, right? I'm not that old, so it wasn't really that long ago. Now what happens is we have to use a student management system that is compatible with what the state state comes in and actually takes the data directly out of our student management system. So not only do they know what kids we, or how many kids we have, they know what the kid's student ID number is, they know if somebody else is reporting them. We spend all this time back and forth trying to say, hey, what, what's going on? Making sure that the kids are coded correctly. We're, uh, we just finished the, the census block peer, or the, the block period to figure out what our average daily membership is. Right, And so when people were sick during that time, it cuts down on what our enrollment number looks like. So it becomes really important that our data, not only is the data that you receive about how kids are doing is good and accurate, but our data and power school are really up to date. So that's why that position sits there. Okay. But looking at a 10%, looking at a 10% increase. So and I, I have a question about that 10% increase. Yeah. So um, my understanding is that we have that operational reserve to bring down that overall cost. Does this budget include that or is that before that? So this budget is just an expenditure budget at the moment. So when okay. I say that there's a 10% expenditure budget increase, I can't even begin to tell you, Anne, what increase that is on the tax rate. Okay. Right? Because Okay, so this is just okay, got This it. is just expenditure. This is okay. just this is the piece of the budget. Think why tonight's important for you and why we bring you these numbers even though they're at a high level and they don't give you much of a picture in a lot of ways. Is it is the part of the budget that the board is in control of. Right? You get to you get to look at this budget and say, right, Michael, we can or we can't support it, right? I, I, like I can sit here and I can say, hey, the board board's going to support the Raven budget. That's easy. Then RTCC looks okay, but long term they need to know that there's some there's some structural challenges with that, and do we want to start addressing that now to get in front of it? And then this 10% increase here, I think that with, this, with the information that I've sent you this year, uh, I mean, Governor Scott's pretty clear, he's limiting his, his state budgets to 3%, right? And so I think the letter that he sent encouraged you to do that as well. And I brought you a budget that provides the same level of service, right? Mm. So, I went with 
I'm going to start with the Orange Southwest Board. Was happy with the service that they had last year. I assume they're going to be happy with that service now. They might not be happy with the price tag. It's possible you're going to tell me, Michael. We need to see a draft that does not include a 10% increase. We know that's going to cause you to have to reduce services. Please spend the next month going back to your team and figuring out what that might look like. Right, and and the script that you just said, that's that's as much kind of feedback or discussion that should be happening tonight. This yes. is a first draft. We're going to, Michael, thank you for including this timeline in your superintendent's report. Um, <clears throat> we will see another draft before we're voting on anything. Yes. Um, so this is very overview. The reason I'm, I'm lassoing to give this little speech is because we do have guests, so I really want to keep us on um, on schedule. That isn't to silence anyone, but comments from Michael should be in that, again, very high level. We really need you to go back, and when you bring us the next draft, it's got to look different like this. Can I ask a question as a new board member? What has our budget increases been over the last several years? Have we been looking at many recent years where we're in double digit increases or? Last year you were, I think Robin and I just talked about this. I think you were at 8.8 .8 last year. Okay. Would you be interested in getting numbers for years no, Fair I'm enough. just trying to get a sense of is this really far off or kind of in the, sounds like kind of in the ballpark, a little higher than last year. I think your 8.8% .8 is much higher than what it typically has been prior to last year. Okay. We've had increases every year since I've been on the board, though. So. But we've also had increases in services. We haven't had a level service budget. We've, we've added services every year I've been here. So this is the first one that's level and a 10% increase. Yeah, and I think that's, that's the, I knew I couldn't bring you a 10% increase with a, you know, the principals really want this or really need that and whatnot. We, we've been right from the get-go saying, I. I I might be able to stand in front of people and say a level service, but I don't know. But this is, I do know this is a, I do know that this is a big increase. And I know that with what the state is talking about, they're going to be looking to put guardrails on and they're going to look at the um, allowable growth and penalties around allowable growth and whatnot. So I could be coming to you at the next meeting and saying, okay, well, in addition to what the normal increase that this would have on the tax rate is, it does this to the budget and whatnot. But I, the thing about building a budget in Vermont, there's no way I know that. I probably don't even know it at the first meeting in December exactly what it's going to be. In fact, you know, I'm pretty fond of saying one of the last things that the legislature typically does is set the set the yield, right? And I can't tell you what your tax rate's going to be without the yield. I can guess, but you have the you have the document from me about when some of those things come out and start giving us better guess. Which I super appreciate as a new board member. It feels like math. Yep. I, I guess I'm just in, this is just food for thought for the board because I don't feel like I have a strong <laughs> enough history to know. But um, when I went to the VSBA annual meeting, I was really struck by members of the Barry School Board who really talked about the struggles getting their budget passed this year. And we've not experienced this in our community and I'd prefer not to because it sounded pretty terrible. Um, so that's just my two cents. And I think it's partially putting a budget uh, before the community that 
can be passed, but it's also thinking about us being the ambassadors yeah, of you. why the budget needs to be what it is and right. what what they would be voting for. I mean, that's that's our our biggest job, not just with the budget, but to be ambassadors for yeah. what the, the district needs. So we need to be thinking about how it presents. Um, I have kind of more detailed questions about like the biggest percentage um, increases I see, but I don't think that this time is where it's for. I don't want to get into the weeds of. I think you're at the next numbers. I agree. And I think that's the next meeting. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. I think at this meeting, assume that these numbers are accurate and reflect a level service budget with the changes that I talked about. Yeah. Yeah. Just in terms of high level concerns, yeah. that's what's appropriate here. Um, given, you know, just looking at this past election, thinking about voter sentiment, the property tax increase that proved to be wildly unpopular, I think that showing the public a level service increase, saying, no, we are actually not adding any services, but costs are going up 10% is going to be a very hard thing to swallow in this particular political climate. Um, we have, luckily, had an incredibly generous community and have never had a problem passing a budget, but I do not want to become too comfortable in that, especially given what we saw in the legislature this past November. Um, I think that this could be a potential for someone to say, no, I'm not voting on this. Um, so from a high level overview, I, my, my one, my concern would be that I don't think the voters would go for this, given what we just saw happen. And it was, you know, disastrous for uh, a lot of communities, uh, so. Um, Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so what you can take back with you is we have concerns. The end. I'm kidding. Um, but and that's fine. To me, that's what I'm looking for. So as a as a superintendent, what I'm going to bring you is, hey, here are the services that you talked about. And if what you're saying and it sounds so far, it sounds like what you're saying is Michael, we'd like to hear about what some of the services that we might be able to back up on and what would the impact on kids be? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think it's it's going to be really hard for me to face my neighbors and then ask, hey, why is this going up? I say, well, you're not getting anything new. I don't know. I mean, I can. Well, no. no hopefully no, we no, have an no, answer there, right. though. I mean, that's what I'm saying yeah. our job is, yes. that you're not getting anything more but these are the reasons that you're still seeing increases. Of course. Um, I mean, yes, I would look for where we can go down and also just explanations for why I see some kind of, you know, 75% yeah, yeah. yes. no, stuff and like I, that. I think it would be helpful to know, like, if you see areas where you think there can be cuts, like, really thinking about what is that impact and, like, in the way that we explain this to people, like, okay, these costs went up, and if we decided that we were okay with them anyway, like, here are the good reasons why if we decided that. Mm -hmm. Like, that we, we don't want to lose particular services that are supporting students. Simply because the costs went up. Right. Yeah. So I understand that, and I'm just going to say this right from the beginning so you get a consistent message from me all the way. Everything that's in this budget impacts students, right? Mm -hmm. So I absolutely understand, and you have to understand that everything in this budget impacts students. Different things impact students in different ways. And I certainly can go back to principals and say, hey, <laughs> right now my 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 speech back to the principal says the board is super supportive of us. They're concerned that this budget in this political climate won't won't pass. And if it doesn't pass, we're going to be there anyway. So let's look at this. Let's see what we can do. And then I will come back to the board and say, here is something that is less than a level service budget. 
is there a percentage that the board thinks that it that like I'm assuming that you want to be as close to a level service budget as you can be. And I don't have to get that percentage now. But I yeah. I mean if someone wants to put a number out there, that's fine in this very brief moment that we have. But I feel like any new restaurant is gonna be arbitrary. I think it would be interesting to know what would be on the chopping block if we were mm -hmm. level funded instead of level serviced. Level funded, okay. Yeah. Great. I think that would be helpful for our community to know that is what we're losing. Right. Sure. If, if we don't. You don't increase, what do you lose? Okay. And, that, and I also wonder if it would, what, what would it look like at the recommended 3%? Okay. It's a lot of work, but yeah, I well, agree. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. I, mean, yeah, I, don't, just I don't mean to. Can you bring us three different budgets, please? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we can. That makes sense. That's, like, that's, that's how I'm used to operating with boards, is that you tell me what you'd like to see and where it would be, and I bring you, this is how we get there. Just and if I can't get there, and I, you know, I, mm -hmm. I have said to a board, I cannot get you to that number. So... Or are you just Legally. saying 3% because that's what you expect inflation to be every year? No. No, no that's, that's what governor said. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Right that's, that's what the voters are hearing. <laughs> <laughs> but that would be a cut. Isn't it 11% health care? Yeah. No. So. Yeah. Oh, it's a significant. To, to, to go from, so the level service budget, you know that a level service budget is a 10% increase. So mm -hmm. to get to 3%, I've got to cut seven. I got to cut seven percent out of the budget. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And to get to to get to zero, ten. So you can don't delete this. Do the math first. <laughs> no, 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 no. I might still vote. Copy for 10%. into it. Right. Yes. I want to. You know, I'm really interested in what does that look. You know, as a parent and a community member yes. and a board member, what does that actually look like? Yes. Because, like Sam said, I might support the 10% budget and really then be able to say, mm -hmm. we really need this, and it's just stinky. Well, I think that's what that's part of what the budget season is supposed to be about. These are supposed to be opportunities for the community to come in and, and see and hear. I have the direction handed that I need. Great. Okay. Um, believe it or not, 25 minutes off is <laughs> pretty good. Not up for us. Um, but thank you for your patience. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and move on to the first of our two guest uh, presentations tonight. Thank you for being here. Yeah. I'm handing it over to you. Okay. <laughs> Bob or Wes, you want to introduce our guest? Uh, 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 sorry. Oh, thank you. you guys know me, I'm all boy. This is uh, Randy Burnett from Lindbergh Architect, and this is Miss McKenzie from, from Lindbergh. And they're here to present a, um, just a high level um, introduction to the feasibility study that we discussed last month. Randy? Right. I'll take it over. We prepared some, uh, a few slideshows. Uh, uh, as talking points that I'll go through quickly. Um, <clears throat> and shares the screen to pull it up. start out with a, a quick intro. I think I'll stand up in front. Sure. So yeah. as we go through the slides, it sometimes a little easier if I kind of point at a particular picture or, or be helpful. Uh, so anyway, a little, little quick background. Uh, uh, I've been working uh, for Colin Lindbergh Architects uh, for over 25 years. Uh, most of that period of time, I've been involved with K-12 uh, uh, schools. Um, our, our, the, the firm's diverse, uh, done work for uh, institutions. We do mostly commercial work, not, not much residential. 
Um, but everything from courthouses, banks, um, office buildings, uh, a lot of institutional work for UVM, Champlain College, and a lot of colleges. Uh, but but my, my niche, personally, in the firm has been a lot of K-12, probably more than half of my, of my work. Uh, we teamed up with some engineers uh, for the uh, observation report of the facility uh, assessment. Uh, uh, we use LN consulting engineers for mechanical and electrical, and we, we've done a lot of work with them, and uh, also civil engineering associates uh, for uh, site evaluation and uh, a little bit of support on sort of structural. <clears throat> uh, we came up uh, last winter and spent several days going through all the district uh, school facilities. Um, <clears throat> and uh, basically, uh, came up with a grading system to assess uh, facility-wide all systems, uh, electrical, mechanical, plumbing, roofing, envelope, uh, life safety, uh, accessibility, uh, essentially everything to do with, with, with the building, uh, including sort of a cursory review programmatically, you know, sort of a, a, a brief review of the spaces as they were maybe originally designed versus how they're maybe being used uh, uh, today, because that's changed over, over, over many times. So um, <clears throat> go ahead, Mackenzie, and, and click to the next slide. <clears throat> oh, I did on my screen. Oh, boy. <laughs> Can you scroll down on this one up here? If you just hit the down arrow. I, I, I did hit the down arrow. It's Sorry. having a <laughs> trouble toggling with it. <laughs> So uh, I'll just kind of continue on a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so here's, is that the second sheet? So I'm just going to get out of presentation mode, and we're just going to click through them. That's the second sheet. So All right, thanks. So essentially, we broke down the assessments into, into these basic kind of categories. Mm -hmm. uh, circulation space, accessibility, uh, uh, concerns, life safety concerns, uh, and, and then again, like systems, mechanical, electrical, envelope, uh, et cetera. We basically kind of gave it uh, our observations, uh, a rating, uh, kind of good, meaning it's either brand new, full code compliance, what you'd expect if you were kind of turning the key and it was a new facility within, say, like the last 10 years or maybe 20 years even, you know. Uh, fair might be, um, well maintained, but has some code deficiencies. There's some upgrades that need to be done, maybe some deferred maintenance level. Uh, but we would expect to use that facility uh, or that space over the next 25 years with some, with some effort to improve that space, some investment with resource to make sure it, it continues to uh, be usable for us. Versus poor, obviously, is a space that definitely needs and, you know, it's failing in multiple kind of categories, whether that's life safety or code or accessibility, or it's just not performing. Uh, it's, it's, it's lived out its expected anticipated life cycle uh, and, needs, and needs a renewal. That's just this building. This is, so we've did this for all buildings in the district. All buildings, okay. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of go through examples that happen in all the buildings, and then I'll summarize at the end kind of where each of the schools individually sort of fell okay. as a holistic. Because uh, we looked at things compartmentally. Because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, electrical systems might be on one end, uh, accessibility might be over here, you know, a different end. You know, but yet we'll have to make, the board will have to make a lot of decisions going forward of how, how, where to put the resources and, and, and how to improve the facilities. Uh, so go ahead and switch to the second slide. So I'm going to get into a couple of slides with some specific examples. There's a lot more of these uh, that we observe, but just to kind of highlight um, some maybe critical ones that that, um, that, that folk, the board should know about. First off, life safety and circulation. Knowing that this, in, in this particular example is this, this building here, the, the high school being 70 years old. Okay. We've had a lot of additions and add-ons and renovations over the years, as one would expect. Well, the original design has some considerations that have been changed or impacted by some of those additions and expansions that maybe were unintended. For example, in a two-story structure, you know, when, when there's an event and people have to evacuate the upper level, 
you want to be able to get out of the building in, in, a, in an expeditious manner, right? So stairways are by code are necessarily required to have direct egress to the outdoors. Well, as you can see in this example here, in, in that particular wing, we don't have that going for us. Does it mean we have to close the school down? No, it doesn't mean we have to close the school down. It just means it's not in full compliance with a new building and what we would expect. What it does mean, though, is the ratings for that enclosure have to be maintained to the exit point. Okay, so in today's code climate, as compared to when the building was built, that's challenging for the district. So if that stairwell requires, say, a two-hour enclosure rating, because we don't have a sprinkler system, we have to carry that two-hour rating all the way to the, to the outside. So if that's not rated that way now, but we do some work in order to get permits to do the new work, we're gonna, we're gonna be obligated to acquire those added costs to bring anything we do in that area up to code compliance. And that's far beyond what you might be trying to improve, but that's not how the state is gonna look at it when we come to them with a set of permit plans they're gonna say, hey, no, you're touching too much here in this improvement. Life safety is the high priority for us. We're gonna require you to upgrade that. So that, that's, that's one example of, uh, and then there's difficulties in doing that. Even if we were to upgrade that, if we extend the two hour rating, well, that means no glazing in control points or super, super, super uh, expensive glass and corridors if for observation areas for, for offices and, and those kinds of things. And a lot of those are because we don't have a sprinkler system. We get a lot of leeway where those ratings are reduced significantly if we're fully sprinkled and we're, and we're not, right? Okay, uh, good, thanks Mackenzie. <clears throat> Other circulation concerns, accessibility. So get away from life safety for a moment, got that example. Uh, uh, how about accessibility? As we all know, buildings were built prior to uh, ADA uh, adoption. We're kind of grandfathered in, although because being a public institution, we've made upgrades uh, to get by, make, make as much of our facility accessible as possible, uh, but, but it's almost, I don't want to say impossible, but it's very difficult to upgrade a 70-year-old building, a 55-year-old building everywhere, right? We can make token upgrades, a few handicapped bathrooms accessible, a few extra ramps here or there, or a few things that can be achievable, but it's very difficult in, a, in an old building to, to achieve that everywhere. So one good example is the middle school gym, mm -hmm. right? So in order to access the gym, you're for, if you're staying indoors, you're forced to go on a, a set of stairs. So if you're traversing in a wheelchair, you're required to exit the building. Well, in the wintertime, in, in our climate in Vermont, that's, that's less than, than acceptable, really, right? So uh, if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're trying to participate in a program in the gymnasium and you're exiting the building, the only way to get in there is through a, a, an outside entrance. Now, we go and look at that outside entrance, it doesn't even meet accessibility needs. It was built in the, and it was 55 years old. The ramp exceeds the slope requirements. There's no proper landing at the door. Uh, so even getting to the point, we, you know, it still doesn't meet. So in order to, in order to upgrade those facilities would, would take quite a bit of investment um, to, to solve those. They're not unsolvable. But this is just one example, and we have this kind of condition in multiple locations throughout the facility. We have an old elevator. On the elevator, you can't even turn around on a wheelchair. So if you're in and you're trying to operate it by yourself, you're, you know, if you're challenged in movement and mobility, you can't reach the control buttons behind you. Okay, so you're, you're, you're forced to go in. It's only going one level, so maybe you get some help, but now you're in there by yourself going down to the other level and expected to wheel back out backwards, but not able to make the controls if there's some kind of problem in there. You know, it, 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 this is just, you're grandfathered in with, with some of these systems, but they're, 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 not, they're, not, they're not great. Um, <clears throat> new buildings would require an elevator, not only for the wheelchair to roll, turn around, but if there's a first responder event to a second floor where someone has to be removed from the building from a stretcher, can't get them out. 
you know, and a first responder, every second counts to, to save that life. So uh, those are some of the things that we look at. <clears throat> uh, other circulation concerns in the district, this is an example at Brookfield. Um, <clears throat> We have a mezzanine that looks out over uh, the multi-use sort of gym cafeteria space. No access to that upper upper area. No second means of egress. All right, so those are, you know, obviously very expensive to put an elevator in for a small square footage area. Um, storage. Uh, our egress uh, circulation areas get compromised when we have uh, lack of storage. So this example just just showing. What happens when we don't have uh, great storage? There's a lot of pressure that gets put on staff to put things in, in the egress path. And obviously, if there's an event, we can't get out of the building safely, we, we have a problem. So some of the elementary schools have some narrow corridor conditions where uh, there's just not enough space to be, uh, you know, that, that's an oper operational thing we can obviously control, but it's difficult to control if you don't have another alternative to put, put things. Go ahead, Mackenzie. The, I won't spend much time on this slide, but We've got doorknobs that are uncompliant, hundreds of locations. Not, you know, most of the classrooms have been up, updated, but a lot of offices and other auxiliary uh, spaces are out of compliance. There are numerous bathrooms that we have handicap signs telling the public that it meets handicap code. And there was a legitimate attempt to do so. And it's got grab bars. I mean, first glance, that looks acceptable. But the height of the fixture is in compliance. The wood combustible panel closing up the enclosure of the former fixture that used to be there is impeding in the, in the, in the clear floor space of the wheelchair requirement. So it's out of conformance. Uh, so there's efforts, but they fall short. And, and, and those are expected. I see that all over the state uh, you know, in, in, in these old schools. So go ahead, Mackenzie. Uh, we can go on. The stage that was repurposed in the gym for a fitness center. There's no access for anyone in a wheelchair to get up to that. The framing that was put in the proscenium, uh, followed by that picture here, is open wood combustible framing in a non-combustible building. A big, big no-no. So we're not sprinkled, right? This building was built and designed out of non-combustible materials. So in the event of a fire, that we don't have combustibles uh, in the building. And yet, we have conditions over time that have just happen for good intentions, but have uh, not really been maybe the, the, best, the best move forward in, in, in certain cases. Brookfield, uh, attic space, uh, <clears throat> cold environment. <clears throat> uh, you know, the insulation plane is above the ceiling here. And the design of, of the attic space is supposed to be cold, so it controls uh, weather on the roof. Uh, what we witnessed in here is that in a school building that doesn't have a sprinkler system, there's all kinds of rules that we have to maintain. So you're only allowed to have about 3,000 square feet of open space and are supposed to be divided to control smoke or spread of fire, right? Well, the building's old and the compartments that go from one section to another have failed. So the doors that, that lead from one to another don't properly close anymore, compromising that safety component, okay? In addition, we notice the, the ductwork that's in, uh, uh, that is in that attic space that's insulated. Insulation is old, it's failing. In many cases, we found it off, so we're dumping heat into that attic space. That's adding heat to what's supposed to be cold. So what we have happening in the winter is melting on your roof that then starts to run down to the eave where it's cold again and refreezes, causing ice jams, damage to the building, and posing another life safety kind of risk to the occupants below adding a lot of extra maintenance on facilities to maintain the buildings, to, to clear that ice, to keep the this, this site. So it's, you know, one thing going wrong on, in the envelope of the building spurs on multiple things in some cases for, that, for a situation like that. Back at the high school, uh, talking about the combustibles in a building that's supposed to be non-combustible. At one point, you know, the school had a whole band of, of windows all along the whole school. And somewhere along the line, those got replaced. They wore out. Uh, you know, the infill is obviously a, a combustible uh, material that in this type of building without a sprinkler, just, you know, it's the wrong, wrong material choice. Go ahead. Electrical defi deficiencies. <coughs> well, 
without going through all into the weeds, at the end of the day, all the equipment that you see on, on the picture, we're talking 70-year-old electrical components in some situations. You know, some of the additions, maybe it's 55 years old. But in either event, nobody expects anything to have a life expectancy electrically that's older than 40 years. And we're still, you know, we're still operating. And you folks know, like we had an issue last year where we were shut down for a few days because of, of concerns like this. Uh, our engineer just flat out said that someone's going to get hurt if we don't attend to these things. You know, there's going to be a flashback at some point. There's areas where a maintenance personnel or someone who's trying to keep things running, their, their safety's um, at risk, uh, keeping us going. So the, the building's just old and tired is the theme. Uh, the high school, you know. Um, thank you, Mackenzie. More examples, uh, more mechanically for indoor air quality or mechanical and heating plant. You know, the, the high school, at one point had the wood chip, which is, I think most of you know, defunct and not operating, currently operating off fuel oil. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously not the most efficient uh, form of heating plant, uh, but example of, of, of systems that, are, that, are, that aren't working that could, could be better. Uh, just a spattering of uh, examples of ventilation. So we have unit ventilators that are heating most of these spaces. So our uh, bringing in air for ventilation to keep kids uh, healthy and in school and not sick. But they're old systems again. So like we don't have a, any system here of capturing that heat. So when we exhaust air, because we're bringing in air, so we're not under a positive pressure on the building, we're just throwing money out the window, so to speak, right? Because we, we, we've spent money and burnt fuel oil to get the temperature up to 70 but we want fresh air so we're healthy, so we're bringing in and, and tempering that air, but we have to exhaust air and we're throwing that 70 degree air outside without capturing it. Well, today's technology is we recover that heat, right? And we don't have that in this facility. It's, we, we expect in a modern facility to capture 70 to 80% of that heat, so we're not continually reheating all that ventilation air to stay healthy and safe. Uh, and be as efficient as possible. <clears throat> in, the, in the kitchen areas, uh, old kitchens, just quick examples of, we have grease traps in the floor that are connected to some devices, but not others. Uh, and we, and we, we know that we have under, underground slab drainage issues as a result, and that's a code requirement. We have direct, direct vent as examples, uh, direct drainage tide where from sinks that are required to have indirect vents. So these are just plumbing codes that all result back to, you know, controlling health and safety uh, uh, for both workers and, 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 and nutrition. Uh, exhaust hoods in both, both schools, both elementary schools and in the high school that aren't up to code. This one particular example is, is again over at Brookfield where the uh, there's no fire protection over the open range, and the hood is out of compliance. Um, so anything that we do to upgrade there would kick in a requirement by the fire marshal's office to upgrade that stuff. <coughs> you know, all kinds of observations. Rigging safety concerns in the auditorium, 55-year-old performance light uh, heating, which isn't efficient. I mean, those things probably put out more heat than those unit ventilators put out. Uh, obviously, showers that are that are ancient, uh, uh, lav controls, the toilet controls that you know, like that don't meet ADA, are obviously out, the, the worn out. This is a elementary school sink that has no venting. Uh, a stack vent from an elementary school uh, that's venting inside the attic. So, mm. yeah. go ahead, Mac. Okay. Summary. <clears throat> it's not all all bad. I mean, I'm painting. <laughs> a lot is. <laughs> you mean we can reconnect the stack <laughs> yeah. and There's definitely some easy fixes, no doubt. <clears throat> but let's look holistically, kind of, at, at all the school district holdings here. <clears throat> 
I think most of you know kind of the condition of the high school. So the tech center, high school, middle school, those are all 55 to 70 year old mm -hmm. buildings and, and you kind of got the essence of what we're dealing with. And that's a, like many communities in Vermont, it's a big problem. We got old aging facility with systems that have far outlived their expected life expectancy and they're, and they're due uh, for overhaul, uh, if not replacement. On the elementary schools that we looked at, <clears throat> I guess the good news is, is that we're a little bit more across the board. Okay? Brookfield, which isn't as old as, as this facility, is still pretty old, and, and we found to be quite, uh, quite poor in most of the ratings uh, due to life safety, accessibility, uh, and the amount of effort to bring that up to want to use that for the next 25 years really started to qu would question where you're reaching that cutoff point of would it be best better to put those resources into a new facility? Or is there some other way to look at that? Is there capacity in another school within the district that has available capacity in its rooms for their enrollment? You know, we kind of looked quickly at enrollment numbers, not, not to get too in depth, but you know, at first look, it looked like there could be some opportunity to reassess uh, some, op so, some of those opportunities. Uh, Randolph Elementary School, I think, is designed for quite a few more students uh, than are currently enrolled there. So uh, that school is the newest school in the district. It's reaching about a 25-year. It's in good shape. It, it, it needs things because it's 25 years old, and our systems are only designed nowadays to last maybe 20 years. So it is going to need some investment. But that is a building that we can see going on for another 50 years of good quality use as long as we continually invest in that building, right? right? Brains Tree kind of fell between the two. It's, a, it, it, it's construction vintage is from, the, I think, the mid-'80s, uh, late-'80s. Uh, it's serviceable. It could be worth reinvesting in, and, 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 it, and it was easy to see its level that it could also be a building to, to utilize for the next 25, 40 years if we reinvest in it. It would take more dollars to get it up to today's modern standards than it would at Randolph Elementary, but not nearly so much as it would at, at Brookfield. So I think some of the study maybe at Braintree is, does it make sense in other categories, programmatically, enrollment? You know, what, what, is, what do those look like for the dollars that would, that, ne that would be necessary to bring it up? It'd be worth it to the community to invest in it uh, uh, moving forward. <clears throat> so it, kind of, in a, you, you got, I think, a, in a nutshell, where generally uh, the observations kind of fall in their, in their overall rankings. Um, clearly with, with the high school and tech center, the middle school, um, I think, you know, the community uh, has, has some strong, um, strong consideration on, on, on what to do, on what to do here. I think, you know, with my experience on the level that, that we observed and saw, it, it really wouldn't surprise me that investing in this facility here might cost as much as you know 60 to 65 to 80 percent of the cost depending on what you build to build new and if you just do the math you know so we're involved with the Burlington school new project we know that that project is a quarter million square feet we know that their they're investing $163 million on that new school facility. So they're, they're somewhere in the range of pushing towards $600 a square foot for that facility. These numbers are, they're insane. They're, up, you know, they're, they're, they're going, it, it, what's happened in the last few years is, is incredible with inflation, uh, especially with construction costs. Um, <clears throat> This plant's 151 or 2,000 square feet, so it's not quite it's not quite as big. Uh, so you know we, we we won't if it you know if we're looking at a replacement here, you know dollar wise we're not approaching what they would have just for pure square foot. You, um, sorry, what did you say the square footage was? Here, yeah, uh, around 151,000 square feet, give or take. Yeah, yeah. about that. 
Um, so there, there should just be some, some study, some further master planning study uh, and, and assessment. You know, if a new school is somewhere in the range of, I don't, you know, somewhere between five, six hundred dollars square foot number at that number versus trying to renovate something that's 70 years old and expecting it to be a modern facility and you're up at say 70 to 80 percent of the cost already just to renovate but then what you get what you get back are instructional spaces that were designed in the 50s mm -hmm. i mean some improvements <clears throat> can be made but there's only so much you can do with old buildings at some point even though the, the direct comparison is not apples to apples at some point it makes sense for the next 50 years and to our community to make the right choice in that comparison, even though one does cost more than the other. Because what you're getting back meets the programmatic needs of today and is designed in a way of being flexible for the future. So I, I think with, with Burlington's building, what are they projecting for uh, lifetime use? So their new building. Their new building? Yeah. So, you know, our, we say it's a 50-year life use. Now, we say that knowing that, you know, if the community reinvests in that building properly, it, you know, it potentially, it, it's hard to predict where codes go, you know. Uh, buildings that were built at the turn of the century, the 1900s, you know, our forefathers at the, during, say, the 50s, reinvigorated those buildings and they lasted 100 years. Now, but we're dealing with those buildings now and now we're questioning whether or not we can do that again, right? Yeah. So it's very hard to predict if a 50 year building that we design will go to be 100, but it's possible based on past precedent. Yeah. But you have to invest heavily to do so, uh, for sure. Um, newer isn't always necessarily better, as we all know. We, we buy new things and in today's society some things are Design to be disposable, thoroughly, right? However, a new, a new building that meets all new life safety codes and accessibility codes, they're also designed though, so the, new, the future retrofit is going to be easier. You know, and the heating systems are more renewable. You know, so wh whatever we save in utility costs, People like to say it will, it will reduce your utility costs to operate. <clears throat> the reality is, is that it actually nets it out even. You don't really sometimes see that return because the return is in proper ventilation now. Because now you have a few more pumps running, you got some more air circulators running, which do require some energy to run those things. But you, you essentially, your utility paid for that improvement in a healthier building at a net cost, mm -hmm. no increase. So that, that's what a new facility can give you. Uh, uh, yeah. So you know, it, 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 there's a lot of detail in the weeds of all this, uh, obviously. Uh, but um, <clears throat> in the project in Burlington, you said is about is pushing six hundred dollars per square foot. Do you think that it will s that would stay in that range, or do you think <coughs> sort of given? I. <clears throat> well, every year, uh, well, I have not seen years where construction escalation costs have gone the other direction. Right. Right. There have been some times where it kind of flattens out a little bit. Well, and there's been recent years where it's done. And then this. there's been years where yeah. it's just been <clears throat> the kinds of increases we've never seen before. Similar to your operational budgets, where in recent years we've seen, we don't see the 3% in the last few years, we're seeing the double digit increase, right? right. Well, that's a similar situation in the construction industry, too, where those escalation and inflationary costs and increases have been running. Um, so we have to plan on those. You know, I think going forward, we need to understand that we don't know where those are going to be. But this is unsustainable. We can't. Right. Right? Yeah. We can't just say, well, we can't afford it, and let's polish the windows and hope for a better day. Right? That doesn't work. I mean, it's <laughs> I mean, rainer. But, um, yeah, I think, you know, we w I don't believe that, that this community would be building a sizable structure as big as theirs because we just don't have that, that student enrollment that they have. 
So, yeah. so yeah, I mean, if you look at if you did a one to one comparison, you're looking at ninety million. Right. And if we didn't build new, you're looking at on the low end fifty eight million, just to maintain. <laughs> Right, that, that inherently becomes the question. Wherever the math exactly lands, the concept of the equation is that if you try to renovate your 70-year-old building and you land somewhere in a number that's 55 to $65 million to do that, but you still have a 70-year-old building, you know, maybe the ventilation is better and you got a better roof and you've got some better lighting, updated lighting and updated electrical systems. Some of these components, it'll be better. But to maintain it, the but cost to maintain would be it so is not higher. right. Right. right, you're not going to get, it, you know, for twenty percent more, you're you're going to get a modern facility that not only for the current generation going forward for the next twenty years is going to be easier to operate, yeah. requiring less staff to operate, right? But the generation behind us is going to benefit the most. And, 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 and that generation behind us, if we renovate this plant, is going to really wish that their four, four parents, you know, made some different choices, you know, which we deal with in our. I'm kind of miffed, our I'm kind of miffed that the generations before us did not put money away for this eventuality. Well, so we're not planning for the future. And, and it's also remarkable that basically any school that was built in the '70s is just so out of compliance right. in terms of... Well, it's unsafe and it's... Yeah, piping. A lot of reasons for a lot of that. You know, different eras had different kind of mentalities. I think, you know, the environmental concerns of the 50s and 60s, you know, they're not, they're not what we know more today, you know. Um, you know, the electrification and uh, fossil fuel burning, uh, there wasn't the pressures in those days of of realizing one the expense that fuel is just cheap and plentiful and that was modern that was that was state of the art then to get away from coal yeah you know to get away from old technology that was new technology coming out of the out of the uh, mid-century you know yeah but then there's things that's like inexplicable is like you build a non-combustible building and then you do an upgrade to the non-combustible building and you cover it in combustibles like, I don't understand where that, how that happens. Yeah, there's, there, there's, there's some probably errors in judgment along the ways where maybe it was budget related. It, you know, we don't know, right? It was just happened before. There, there might have been some uh, things that needed to happen on an emergency stance or something. It's but I think that is sort of was, I don't, I mean, I don't know if it was just this district, but that was sort of an issue in this district. So what was the, Village School in Randolph had um, reconstruction done. I can't remember exactly when, but it was it was a failed building. It was a pretty significant and sanitation. And the downtown district there. Yeah, yeah which is the why flat. they built RES, and they tore that building down where Dubuque King is now. So that was a longstanding issue. Braintree, when it was first built, it was essentially completely rebuilt again within the first five years because of poor engineering, essentially. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of a theme in the district at that. And this is sort of what I'm remembering from my childhood, so it's not exact, but there have been longstanding issues. And I went to elementary school in a building that was built in 1912 and is still used by VTC. Um, I think what's also evident that we as a boiler, that your district needs to consider is out is beyond your district knowing that many school districts in Vermont are facing the same issues you, that this district is facing and knowing that their challenges are equaling our challenges you know, a lot of that's funding like we you know a project like this is probably just cost prohibitive on our own it's going to need to be some level of help. But when so many districts are in the same situation, the, you know, the, the state uh, in trying to help, is, is, that, is that an issue too? Because um, it's all come and do, you know, kind of at the same time. At the same time. Yeah. Yeah. 
word it. Word. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I just wonder, having kids, you've been through this in other districts. What what is our next? It being crystal clear, in in my opinion, what needs to happen? What is the next step? What it, is it? Is it getting the messaging out? I mean, is it is it PR right. work that comes next? Hold on. Is Can it, you just say what you said is crystal clear in your mind? Can you just be really clear about what's crystal clear in your mind? In my mind? Yes. No. <laughs> Things are very rarely clear. <laughs> um, that uh, we cannot continue to house our schools in the existing buildings. That's what I think. Okay. Is, that's what's Carry crystal on. clear to me. Okay. So, yeah, and let me clarify, too, to make sure that there's not... I don't want to spread the wrong message. Mm. What we're saying is that we don't need to close school tomorrow because we feel like there is an imminent danger of what's here today. Mm -hmm. But what's not sustainable is to not plan and not figure out solutions. Like that's the part that needs to to happen. Like we need to have a plan that moves forward that is affordable, that is sustainable, and how do we get to that? And there's some there's some real challenges on some of those solutions, uh, but we, so there has to be some creative thinking. Uh, right, because the number's not going to change. I mean, give or take, right. but but such a high number that it's not going to significantly change. So it's about thinking about different avenues in which to get there in terms of funding, so that we can provide safe structures that are efficient in use. Um, I know Michael has been, you've been thinking about different pathways that might get us there. It sounds to me like that's the next public discussion that needs to be had. Um, the, the end goal being <clears throat> magically having these millions of dollars. How, is, how are we going to make the magic happen, I guess, is the next. So I think what was interesting as a, you have an audience member with their hand up too. Oh, thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, I just have a question about what we mean by um, thinking outside the box, because that sounds like we're trying to think about outside the box. Um, and one of the ideas that's coming to my mind, whether it's feasible or not, is uh, we have a fantastic large BTC not far away from us, and are they fully utilizing all of their space, and is it the kind of thing that we could collaborate with them on in an intermediate solution, even if it wasn't long term? So that that is the ideas like that. I don't think we're there tonight to to have those kinds of conversations. Um, I think. <clears throat> Those kind of conversations are definitely in very soon on the path. I think we also need to think very specifically about what the work of the board is here, um, the work at this table, and then and then bringing in the ownership. So I think ownership. what I got to watch tonight was board members who are probably some of the most informed community members about the conditions of the building. Right, and you've heard the Buenos Aires study where the this is this is the worst building in the state of Vermont tonight, and it's recorded, so anybody in the community can watch the presentation that Randy that Randy gave, or they can hear and they can see the pictures. I watch board members understand why Buenos Aires came up with that as Randy was talking, and then understanding like the moment. There was a moment where <clears throat> Randy was talking about the direct egress out of stairwells and that you have to maintain the rating, the fire rating, because we don't have direct egress all the way out. And suddenly there were at least four board members who said, wait a second, that means we totally have to redo that hallway all the way down to the exit. And the cost of doing that is going to be astronomical and all we get at that point is fire safe. I mean, it's important. It's base compliance, right? but it's not even renovation. You're back right? to where you started. It's exactly. So I back think what down. happened tonight, or what I'm starting to hear happen tonight, you as a board <laughs> knew that the building was in need. 
I don't know if you knew why the building was in need or how. I think the fees, what the feasibility study does is it gives you the language. People can watch that and have the same reaction that you had. Randy, I don't remember how long you were here this, this summer with me. You had a whole crew of people with you. I think, I think Heather and I and Robin, I think we sat for a good three plus hours. I might be soft. We brought in the whole engineer team. And yeah. Kind of got a little more into the weeds, but. <clears throat> yes. And so, you know, I, I think that the community needs to understand that. I think the next step that you that that you're in right now, if you if you have that same, if the board is sitting here saying, okay, we've got to be at a spot where we're starting to think about what's what are we going to do for a building as we as we go. The, what you heard tonight is it's not tomorrow. Wes and Bob are crossing their fingers back there saying, we hope it's not tomorrow. We're going to open and everything's going to be okay. Right? But no, seriously, these guys have some contingency plans in place for systems that could right. fail. Right. I mean, that, we giggle, but that's there, there are imminent risks and dangers. Yes. Yeah. We got brought up last month. You want to listen to right. them? Well, I mean, so with to music. <laughs> You so, sleep tonight. Yeah. So I think what you've got to do next is you've got to decide, we've got to decide, are we building a school for 325 kids, which is replicating what we've got? Or are we looking at talking with neighbors and saying, hey, we're in the spot where we have a building that is needing to be, we've reached the point where we understand that it needs to be replaced and we're going to build, or that's what we're thinking about doing. What do y'all think? Are you interested? Do you want to get in on that? Yeah. And I think that that could be something as simple as a letter to uh, Central Vermont SU and the district that operates in White River White River Valley. Those would be the partners that I would see you reaching out to. They're the ones that are immediately nearby. Well, and I know our primary discussion is about this building, but Brookfield is in red up there as well. Mm -hmm. I, you know, that has to be at the forefront of our conversations as well. Yeah, I think what we're I think what we're looking at when we talk about when we talk about buildings outside of this one is what are we how are we using RES mm -hmm. and what what makes what makes some sense there you know what do we what do we need to do are we, are we going to again this is going to be board and community discussions and decisions what what Randy talked about for uh, RU and RTCC it it bring uh, Brookfield's not super far super far behind that and it has some other pretty unique Pretty unique challenges, being that that it's a and one answer for one mm -hmm. might be a different answer for the other, and both provide solutions. Mm -hmm. Right. So, mm -hmm. I, I think we're looking at we're looking at those kinds of things, and <clears throat> we're we're you're having a conversation. I imagine that part of what we're doing today is we're having a conversation. There's a recording of that conversation. There are one, two, three, four, five-ish people, six, seven audience members, right? So maybe this is gonna maybe this is gonna go out into the community a little bit more. I'm gonna put it in my next board report. We'll put it in our update. Uh, well, and maybe newsletter. The, maybe and the, the board ownership and ownership linkage, linkage committee could think right. about something that mm -hmm. is more deliberate. Sounds way more exciting than a letter. <laughs> no, do I mean we then we have some I'm kidding. But, yeah. and yes. and and bring back a proposal of what what that kind of deliberate next conversation with the with the community is because um, the our regular board meetings are not that place to have that conversation i think there needs to be um yeah we've got yeah, a an plan. intentional right mm -hmm. we've got a plan uh, and this this is a study of the bricks and the mortar right mm -hmm. of the building what the study doesn't dive into is programmatic how are you using those spaces inside the brick and the mortar? Mm -hmm. Now, we, we've done a cursory analysis of the numbers of spaces you have, and, and generally, you know, we know your enrollment and those kinds of things. But we don't have broken down as to, well, how many students are in each of these spaces? 
what kinds of programs are in, in all of this? Is it, what's the utilization rate? Is it being utilized properly? Do we even need to build this much square foot? Hmm. You know, if no one wants to partner with us, with our neighbors, if that's the answer, after we go out and, and talk and we, and we find out that we're on our own, do we even need to build this big anymore? Maybe we can come up with creative ways to be more efficient, but we won't be able to answer that question without that study. We need to kind of dive into the building programmatically and make sure we really understand what we need, mm -hmm. this community needs. But if the answer comes back from our neighbors that they have some interests for their future on some things that they could see that would, that could, pro, that could benefit their students with maybe expanded program access because there's some consolidated efforts amongst neighbors working together and getting some efficiencies of, of scale working together and shared resources to pay for it together, well then they'll need their internal program study as well so we can mesh those. And we'll, we'll, we'll need, this community will need to have that prepared and ready because they'll ask that question. Right. Well, if they do want to work with us, here's what we need. What do you need? And we need to know that. Yeah, do you have any sense of the state of the brick and mortar in the neighboring districts? I have a little bit. We've been doing some work with um, Central Vermont. Okay. Uh, we did a couple projects this summer for Williamstown High School. We did an ADA study this summer, and we did uh, some indoor air quality and, and equipment replacement at uh, Williamstown Elementary. So I think they're, you know, probably their high school's in a little bit better shape uh, than here, but it's old too. Yeah. Um, they have some similar situations, maybe not that deep red or <laughs> whatever, you know, uh, but they have. Again, Vermont, you know, a lot of our districts are in very similar situations. So they may not be utilizing their building 100%. It would be good to know. You know, if their building's not ready for replacement, just ready for a renovation, but they have space, well, maybe it makes sense to do something there. I, I don't know. So would the districts that you're working with, I know this isn't necessarily in the scope that you guys have been on for so far, but what are you recommending like kind of back to what Hannah was asking, given that this legislative biennium is going to have a lot of impact on school funding, this various construction rehab PFAS situation, and how these things will be bonded, yeah. what are you telling districts that they should be doing right now to hit the ground running? So that way, when we are actually in a position to make a move, how can we, you know, be, be best prepared? So Sam, I think I can grab that for you. Okay. I think that the way that you hit the ground running is we got to figure out what we're doing. What direction are we running before we start running, right? And we do that by talking with the neighbors and saying, hey, What's going on? What are you thinking? What, what does that look like? Talking with our community, making sure that our community understands. Not, I mean, I mm -hmm. talked to a community member this week that said, you know, I didn't realize that it was identified as the worst building in the state. I drive by it and it looks fine, right? So we've got education to do with people. We've got to make sure that we know what's, what's going on. And then we can see what happens. So we're not... Even if you, nobody's going to do this, but even if you decided tonight, Michael, we're going to come up with what number do you want me to use here? The 600 times 150,000 square feet, 90 yeah. million. We got 90 million dollars. Get that building built. Let's stop talking about it. Let's go as a as a board. Right? The building's not going to be built next year or the year after. I think maybe these guys, I don't know, I'm not watching them. I'm trying to tunnel vision into you here, Sam. <laughs> maybe three, four, or five so, years yeah. out? So schedule-wise, if we just holistically here, we're at this sort of the one-year phase of what is it we want to do and how are we going to do it and who are we going to do it with. That, that whole piece probably takes almost a year because okay. you've got communication, 
outside our boundaries that occur. There's some dialogue that go back and forth. There's some new legislation that's probably going to come out that we want to understand how does that impact some of this decision making. You know, if there's going to be some state A, we want to make sure we're checking the right boxes that we're doing the right things to qualify for that for those things. But those are unknowns at the, at this at this time and juncture. And then once we know the direction that we want to head in, well, then it's design time, right? So that it, just call it a year to design the actual project. And then in construction, the construction project at, at, at Burlington is fast being fast tracked, and it's a two year build out on a fast track because those kids were put into a downtown yeah you know you understand right right here we ha might have the advantage of not being thrusted into that situation maybe you know we might be have that to our side so maybe we don't have to have the high cost of fast tracking do we need action items tonight? well i think the action item tonight maybe is to authorize hannah and myself to craft a letter that we can send out to Neighboring boards, yes. so to start a conversation. I think that's a good idea. So, then, so I will entertain a motion. <clears throat> I move that Hannah and Mike craft a letter, reaching out to the neighboring districts good, to ask good them to about thank you. what their plans are for their buildings and if they might have any interest in collaboration. Uh, do, uh, do, do I have a second? Second. Seconded by Sam. Further discussion? All those in favor, visibly, audibly? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Before Randy leaves, does anybody have any other questions for him? Board? Oh, back there. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, well, I you prefer to initially oh, okay. ask the board. Thank yep. you. If there Just are. quickly, what, how old is a Brookfield school? Uh, 1969. 68. 68. 68. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah, so we're 50. In the discussion, I think you had uh, Brain Tree was in 90, and you're right, within 10 years, they had to go in and redo mm -hmm. the whole envelope because we had mold and contamination within that building from the failure. Good memory. Thanks. <laughs> um, came in useful this one time. <laughs> Random fact. If there are further questions from the public, because we do need to move on, um, I would ask that you email the board members. Um, you can email any of us, and and we'll make sure everyone gets it or or the super. I think it was specifically for the guest. Yeah. Sorry. I think the question was, was specifically for, for the guest. Yes, oh. but uh, we really do need to move on in the agenda. So I'm going to uh, okay. thank the guests very, very, <clears throat> very much for not only your presentation but for waiting as long as you did to begin the presentation. Thanks for your patience with our little yeah. technology. It worked out. You got to stop presenting now. Yeah. Oh, oh, we have to stop presenting. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Get some rest. Um, just to speed things up, I'm going to quickly ask if there's a, a, an overview review of anyone who is at the VSBA conference who wants to say four words. No, I'm kidding. But if anyone who was there, I was there the first day, but people who were there the second, takeaways. I mean, I, yeah, being with us, the Berry City, the Berry School District Board was pretty impactful hearing about their budgeting process. Um, it was a great learning opportunity, honestly, as a new board member to just sort of understand many of the concepts that I feel I've sort of been drowning in. It just sort of helped frame things, shore things up a little bit. So it was good. It was good for that. Good. So. Great opportunity, go. Great opportunity, go. Wow, Three that words. was three. Economical, Michael. I think words. I was impressed with the presentation on mission and vision. Great. Right, which was, um, I think we should just keep going, though. I don't okay. want to elaborate at this time. Okay. Um, <laughs> if there's more that you want to share that you took away from it, maybe. Um, 
could write share up an executive with us summary. or put it in the newsletter or something like that because mm -hmm. I think it's great for all of us to know. Okay. Thank you, Heather. My pleasure. Um, module one of our accelerator program. Um, you know, it's a, it's a pretty basic intro kind of module. Uh, so I don't think we have to have a long conversation about it. I did, however, ask Kyle <clears throat> to at some point get us, um, I, I put the glossary of terms um, mm -hmm. it, into a Word document just so, I don't know, is it in here or not? The one I sent you today. Yes. So that's not very helpful. But if it's printed, great. If not, we'll take it next time. But just to put into our binders, mm -hmm. I think that's kind of a, a, a baseline, just terms that come up. Oh, she's good. She's mm -hmm. good. Oh, I <laughs> um, did anyone, is, are people having the initial reaction that, wow, this is going to be really helpful? Um, glad we're doing it. Good investment. Boy, what a waste of money. Anything like that. And the first module really just scratched the surface, right? Okay. Some right. definitions and so I anticipate it's going to get a lot more substantial as we move into further modules. The quizzes are gonna get harder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um yeah, I enjoyed the questions too, filling in the little notes. I didn't think that any of them were, you know, meaty okay. enough to use as discussion points, but I think they eventually will, if I remember correctly. Um, if anyone feels I'm being too rushed about this training, see me after the meeting. Our next guest, <laughs> um, Lisa, thank you so much for your patience. Oh, it's no problem. Intro that. I did wonder a little bit if it might be nice for the principal to like welcome people to their building at the beginning when the public is still here. I know we only had two members of the public. Noted. Um, yes. Thank but you. I, I wonder if that might be a change that would be useful just because I think it is so useful, especially during the budgeting process for people who, who pay the taxes and fund our buildings mm -hmm. to know what we do and who we are and get a sense of the things that are happening at our schools. So I prepared two handouts this evening. If those could come all the way around, that would be great. Um, one of them is just about some initiatives that I spoke about last year when I spoke to the board and to reflect on where we're at with those things. Um, and then the other is just, again, an opportunity to um, look at our student engagement survey data. And I've compiled that as longitudinal data because um, we now have a total of five data points, but I left the original, original one off because we only pulled about 100 students and because that's only a third of our student body. I chose not to include it. Um, and that was the very first one um, in the fall of 2022. So um, our students who are headed to our exchange in Cuxhaven, um, Germany, have just gotten off the ground. I got a message from Katie Vincent Roller um, as we were listening to the previous presentation. So that's very exciting. Um, so some of the things that we have been working on this school year that have been really exciting, we're continuing our work on addressing behaviors, a two-pronged approach, so building social-emotional learning into some classes so that students can take classes with our social-emotional learning coordinator. They're outdoor-based and he is working hard to embed some of the learning about empathy and about expectations into the curriculum so that students are in highly engaging classes but also learning how to self-regulate and how to engage more deeply in classes that may be less engaging for them. And then the other approach is just, you know, really working hard to have an empathic but supportive and and um, boundaries-based approach to discipline and what we expect of students and really reining things back in from where they may have been during the pandemic and working with the emotional, social emotional needs, but at the same time making clear that we have some expectations um, for our classroom environments for all students. 
we have been working on skill building related to literacy and math. We have extension classes that focus both on building skills and on helping students um, keep up with their classes. There are still gaps for sure. Students in a lot of areas um, aren't, aren't necessarily where we want them to be, but we're working to address those, those gaps. Um, and then we are offering a lot of hands-on and nurturing opportunities for students, both through project-based learning in our regular classroom environments and in our innovation centers. Um, both of those programs, the Innovation Center and PBL program, have grown dramatically in the last two years with all of our classes in the Innovation Center, so our STEM programming, at capacity. Um, and our PBL program is now also um, at capacity in those classes. So one of the things that's really exciting to me about the project-based learning classes is um, our, the amount of community outreach that they do. So they've worked a lot with the rec center. They have worked a lot with um, the organization for focus on racial equality group, and they have continued to work with various other local organizations to talk about how to improve community. And the benefit there goes beyond just what it does for the community and in terms of like our students connecting with our elders and understanding how they can serve the community, but it also gives them a sense of agency and belonging, and it helps people in our community see teenagers in a more positive way than they might otherwise think of teenagers. Um, we do have strong in-house supports, and I think it's really necessary at this point in time that we have those supports just because of the needs of our community. So we have a school nurse. We have a nurse practitioner here from Gifford three days a week. Uh, we have a school-based mental health clinician who is at capacity or her capacity is on par with a peer working in a private organization. And this year we have a dedicated student assistance program counselor who focuses pretty heavily on substance use and abuse. And um, that person has only been with us since the start of the school year. And she is also serving, um, she's also at capacity in terms of her regularly scheduled slots. So the students who access her may not be accessing substances themselves, but they might be struggling with the use of a family member or someone else close to them. So it's a really vital part of our, our school community and helping our students be able to work through challenges they face in their lives so that they can really attend to the academics that we hope that they will engage in. And they're accessed voluntarily? Yes. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. I mean, sometimes they'll get a referral from a school counselor okay. yeah. or a teacher or a grade level team, but they, right, if they don't attend or they don't engage, then we give the spot to somebody who will. Mm -hmm. So um, we also really have been focusing on curriculum and continue to work with our district coaches and our departmental teams to expand offerings. Um, we offer two world languages, which I think is remarkable for a school of our size, and those classes are well enrolled. We have a strong performing arts program. Um, so our theater is dynamic, and it has, the size has doubled from previous years, or last year. And we also offer dance after school. So I don't know if any of you follow us on Facebook, but if you do, you would see there um, they've started doing a Halloween choreographed video, and they did that again this school year, but that's part of our Alternative Pathways program. So students who might not feel comfortable taking a physical education class or necessarily doing an ILO and doing that self-directed learning to get their PE credits can take dance after school. It's another rigorous movement-based class that they can engage in in order to um, fulfill their PE credit in a way that they might really enjoy. So 
Yeah, we're continually seeking student feedback from students, staff, and families in order to improve. And I um, put some of our goals on the back side of this sheet. Um, so we are looking to have um, diplomas that have a specific stamp based on the concentration that a student has um, really engaged in. This year, we think we have four seniors who would qualify for a STEM stamp. So we're working on finalizing what we need to do to get them. I mean, to make sure that we're creating a system with integrity and then we'll look at humanities and fine arts um, as well. We did graduate a student in 2023 with a biliteracy stamp, so that's, he's fully bilingual um, and took a lot of programming here to, um, really dug into his education and languages. So that's exciting. When students find their area of passion or focus and they really wanna go deep with their learning. Um, we have a second year of student government that's really focused on proposals, giving us proposals and really working together with our school leadership team to improve our culture and climate here. Um, and we're continuing to seek ways to engage the community in some of our, to give us feedback to know how we can serve the community better. We have a PBL advisory board that helps inform that program. And um, we had a family and community advisory board, but a number of the parents who were really involved, their kids graduated, and so now they're less involved. So we're working on building that up again. Any questions about all of this? I, I'm trying to stay within like my 10 minute time limit. So I, there's a lot you can email me or follow up by asking a question if you have questions. Your coffee um, m m gathering meetings, yeah. how is the attendance? Zero. Oh man. I know. Um, oh, so I sent out a survey in last week's newsletter to families yeah. um, and I got some feedback that I think is really helpful. Okay. Um, no one has said that mornings work for them. So I think that, um, I mean, the goal was last year, we had a few families where the parents worked nights and said, I would come, but I'm at work when you have your forums. So I was like, okay, we'll do something in the morning and see. Yeah. I think that this week's will likely be our last one. And then um, some of the ideas that I got from my recent survey were to host a forum during a middle school dance and really advertise it and see if families wanted to come and have a conversation about school while their kids were in the dance. So I thought that was creative, might be worth a try. Um, and then, um, then we can peek too. If right. What's going on. Yes. <laughs> Just like, yes. Yeah. There are big glass windows right there. Um, kids would hate that. Yes. Um, but we could, we could do that. Um, yeah, and another was just to add the like Zoom component, which we have moved away from just because it's so nice to be in a space with people and to bring people into the school, but perhaps we'll need to go back to that just to be more inclusive. Cool. Thank you. Um, so if you look at this sheet, this is our student engagement survey. Along the left-hand side, we have the questions that we ask the students. These are not anonymous surveys because there's information that we really want about individuals. Um, primarily, we wanna know that every student has a supportive adult that they can reach out to if they're struggling. And so what we do is ask students, do you have an adult who you feel you would be comfortable talking to? And then we ask the student to name that person. And if they don't name somebody or if they say no, then we know that we can bring that information to the grade level team. The grade level team can look at it and determine who's going to really make an effort to support that student. And if we did this anonymously, we wouldn't have that information, we wouldn't be able to do that. So um, just at a glance, there are some numbers, um, and I'm gonna go quickly down through this page that we found concerning or that it, there's a Puzzling aspect, yes. Can you explain what the answer, you said three, like your, can you explain what the answer options were? Three what, or higher. What, three like or higher is like feeling okay about things, and four is like the most favorable. Okay, so it was one through four. Give. It was a five piece scale. Okay. Yep. 
zero through four? Um, one through five. One through five. Okay. Yes. Hmm. Okay, thanks. No, sorry. One through four. Okay. You're right. Okay. So, um, one thing that, yeah. as we looked at it as a um, director, as an admin team, we were concerned about the number of students right at the top who maybe are not so excited about what they're learning that they think about it outside of school. We'd like to bring that number up. Um, we appreciate if we go down to the third line down, I feel appropriately challenged by my learning experiences in school. Um, so we're at an all time high at 87%. So that felt good because we've been working on adding rigor back into our coursework after the pandemic. Um, then if we go to the second one in the first section, second from the bottom, the skills and concepts I am learning will help me in my future and support my future goals. Um, we want to raise that number. It's 67% said that they felt like they either did or did to a high degree support them. Um, and so we're, that tells us, I think, that we need to work on drawing connections between what students are doing and life beyond the classroom, whether that's continued education or whether it's a, a career pathway. Um, we feel really good about 80, students thinking that 85% or 85% of students feel like adults at school care about them, and 95% say that they have a trusted adult at school. So there's a little bit of work we need to do there. Um, but we also are concerned about only 57% of students saying they feel like their opinions are valued and they have impact on their school environment. So we're working on you know, more regular feedback, we're asking the student leadership team to take a look at this data and see what they think is strong about it and where they think there needs to be improvement. So soliciting feedback is part of that. Um, I appreciate that students are using their callbacks well or feel like they're using them well this year. So that was at 90% callback is a time when either the teacher can stop call a student back for enrichment or remediation or a student can say, I'm not understanding something. I need to meet with that teacher. And they tell their advisor and get scheduled with that person. Um, we also are continuing to work on down here, three from the bottom, it says 81% of students say that um, they aren't always treated with kindness and respect from their peers. Not their friends, but their peers. And so although 81% is the highest that number has ever been um, since we've been pulling this, it feels like if 19% of our students feel like people aren't treating each other with kindness and respect, we've got some work to do on empathy and kindness. So um, that's just a glance at that particular survey data that we've been collecting for the last few years. Um, any questions for me? Do you think you would get significantly different results if it was anonymous? So that is another question. This isn't all the data. Um, there are, I think it's about 7% of students respond and say they would answer the question, the questions that's differently. A, that's a question that's in there. That's a question ah. in there. Um, because I am, we are curious about that. Um, but. But they're identifying themselves too. With right. you, like saying, yes. yeah, I, I told you what you want to hear. Right, yes. <laughs> but, here's my name. Yes, <laughs> right on the same thing. Um, that number would be higher too. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's interesting, even though it is not an anonymous survey, it's interesting when we read, I only pulled the portions um, that have a percentage. So I didn't pull the narrative portions to share. It's really interesting the student, students who will say things like, I'm struggling to quit using vape. Like, I'm, they, they know, there's no, there's no pretense that it's an anonymous survey. We ask you to put your name on it. We ask you to put your pronouns in it. We ask all of these things. And then they still share things like, this is something I'm struggling with. This is something I wish I had more support for. So even though there's a small percentage who say, I would respond differently if this were an anonymous survey, I still feel like the data that we're getting from it allows us to think about how we use the resources and supports that we have to help strengthen our school community. So 
Mm -hmm. I'm not feeling like that's compelling. How, how long does it take to do the survey? Usually about one advisory period. Um, so, so not, not sure. Not, not a tremendous amount of time. Um, most students who take it seriously, it takes about 20, 25 minutes, I think. OK. I was just thinking, what if you did two versions of it, one anonymous, one without? Yeah, that would be. It would be interesting to see what the differences were. Back to back. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you will spend a whole class period being surveyed. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Lisa. Yeah, no problem. Very cool. What were the two languages for the biliteracy seal? Um, Spanish and English. Yeah. We do have six students um, accessing the Vermont Virtual Learning um, Consortium, and they are taking Japanese. So mm -hmm. cool. Um, and we've had students in previous years interested in taking German. Um, so I think that is an interesting way for students to access languages that we just don't have the capacity to offer. We offer French and Spanish, and students are pretty excited to take those classes. Professor Bartlett is very popular in my house. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the friend group. That's Spanish. Yes. Spanish. Yep. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Lisa, thank you so much. Yeah, have a great night. Thanks. Uh, let's see. Executive limitation. 2.2 second read. Dun -dun -dun -dun. I'm just sifting through getting it in front of me here. Um, treatment of staff. Michael, do you want to talk at all about it? Oh, this, this is, is the one where we went. With, I went with the new format yeah. last mm -hmm. month and seemed like I got my feet under me, me there. And so I don't think that there was, I think people, maybe Anne said, it would be great to go back and do the other two before that in this format, <laughs> right? So, yeah. Is this the one that had? Um, I just have a kind of. I'm interested to know how your attendance is with the the voluntary meeting via Google Meet. More than zero. More than zero. Hey, I'll take it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. About the report itself, anyone? Uh, yeah. So, under you, you wrote about uh, preparedness, um, and I think somewhere in here, allow staff to be unprepared for emergency situations. And I was just thinking. Um, I would imagine there are drills that are being done, or are there no drills being done? No, there are drills being done. Mm -hmm. um, and they're done on a monthly basis, right? They're done in accordance with the schedule that is set by the state of Vermont. So sometimes more than once a month. It would seem to me that that would be good evidence that our staff are prepared because they're doing these monthly drills. Yeah. Might, it might just be something that we can add. Mm -hmm. I would like to know they're being done. <laughs> and if we put it down for evidence, then I'm mm -hmm. feeling like that's assurance that they're getting done. Sure. And then significant devotion of professional development agenda to emergency response and preparedness. What's significant devotion? <laughs> like, is there, what does that mean? I guess this, for evidence, what does that mean? Uh, well, you'll remember that you went back and you got the professional development schedule from the beginning of the year. That was one full day. Okay. Um, 
So again, I'm just wondering if we want to be more specific in our evidence or have that um, schedule in here or as a, I don't know, do you, are you making binders that go with these with some of the? I will be, yes. Okay. So like something like that would be in the binder? Yes. As, as the, okay. All right, that's, that's all I had for questions. Anyone else before we perhaps make a motion to accept? Then I will entertain a motion if there is one to be made. I will move that we uh, approve the executive limitation uh, 2.2. Uh, treatment of staff. I will second. Thank you, Anne. Uh, further discussion? All those in favor, audible and visibly, please. Audibly and visibly, please. Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Great. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you for your work on this, Michael. Next, a first read of two financial planning and budgeting, and emergency superintendent succession. The same format? Really like in the format, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I did, so you got the bulk of that last night, and I did uh, get a chance to talk with Jeannie today. And <laughs> Felt good about that conversation, so shared with her that the template really, really did help me focus to say, hey, and it's enough different that it doesn't just feel like a rehash of what you've had before. Yeah. I also appreciate the inclusion of the um, procedure, not policy, procedure, yeah. um, for how we go about it, yeah. seeing as we used that. Does anyone have um, anything that they'd ask be judged for the second read? I, I haven't had enough time to look at them that closely, so I will click. I will. I'll just email you like I did the last time. Perfect. Okay, then uh, we look forward to the second read. There's no motion needed there. Um, again, thank you for your work on, on these. I feel like we're really getting there. Uh, policy decisions. So first reads of several, um, which were, was interesting reading, first of all. You know, these are required. Well, some of them are required. Most of them are required. All of them are required. All of them are required. Dun -dun -dun. Right? Be yeah, these They're are required. all required. All yeah. Required. So I guess what people should be looking for are things that they may or may not think are specific to OSSD that, you know, they feel should be included. But these are required policies. Yeah. Then we look forward to a second read. Um, please do read them for important stuff. Uh, Self-evaluation. This is, an, if I'm remembering correctly, because when did I send this? Um, it, it, it's about, you know, governance investment, appropriate um, allocation of funds. I'm going to open with this question. Did people have the time and capacity to consider this policy? Because sometimes we do and sometimes we don't, and that's okay. I sound very Mr. Rogers, but I just want to put that out there. There's a lot to read. We're really focused on budgeting. I don't want to spend time on the agenda on something if people didn't have the time to I get will to admit, it. Yeah? I did not look through this one this time. So. 
I am not okay. prepared. I see some nodding. <laughs> I did, um, but I didn't, I didn't really have it. I mean, I did think about it, but I didn't have yep. any strong feelings in any direction. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. same. Okay. I read through it. It, it didn't strike me as, it, it struck me as fine. I, yeah, no, yeah no this isn't a really meaty one. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, so we have two options. We can put it back on um, with another, so we would have two for next time, remembering that we are getting a second draft of the budget. So while I don't mean to demean or diminish um, the importance of our self-evaluation, it is part of our job. Um, I also, for the less meaty ones, I, I do think it's okay to kind of table. We'll do the next one in the next meeting. Well, and this one is so easy. Have we invested, we did we did we yeah. invest in some training since? Yes, yeah. yes we have. Um, and continue to do so. And we're continuing, we're doing more training this, this time, so it seems like we get audited, um, you know. And we made a budget. We put a budget number in. Please don't put it back on the agenda. I will, so I will not. I think we're good to go. Even if I don't think we have any. Seven. We followed this policy. Yep. Boom. Yep. So I think we're, we're good. Sometimes that's what evaluation is about. Right. Are we right. keeping to that's it? That's yes. what we're doing. Great. We're checking in. Did we do it? Yeah, we've been doing it. Did we, are we skipping over six completely? Because they're all oh. first read? What did I do? You jumped to seven. Oh, well, yeah, just, this first read. They're all first read. It's all first yeah. read. So yeah. just really quickly, I oh. want to let you know that the alcohol and drug free workplace and the um, pupil privacy rights are required policies that have been updated by the Vermont School Board Association with minor updates. Um, so a little bit of language defining what a drug is has been uh, improved. And um, then we have the harassment ones on there specifically to move the identities of who they are into procedures and out of policy. So that if someone leaves or moves within the district, we don't need to put it in front of the board to change the policy. We can just change the procedure. That's great. <laughs> Thank While you. we so enjoy first and second reading. So thank you. thank you. I didn't yep. mean to breeze breeze over things, but um, thank you for pointing out what the changes are. And a new definition of a drug. Let's find out what that is. <laughs> I think they added more words. Oh. Like they added barbiturates and huh. oh, they added they they made it more clear. Cool. Okay. Um, minutes. Does anyone have any um, edits for minutes? I'm going to quickly go through this and, and uh, see if we can do the consent agenda in one enchilada. But uh, I'm going to start with minutes. Anyone have any issues with the minutes? No. No. Um, the new hires, the only, I, I would just like to say seeing a few transportation How new hires that? was fabulous. Yeah. I was very excited about that. It was the only part of the budget I didn't really care to see the number go up on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what else do I remember about the list? It looked like there were some new substitutes, which yep. I think is great because I know we were struggling. Well, and as you point out in the in the superintendent's report, you know, a, a bump in pay is incentive. Mm -hmm. uh, does anyone have any questions about that consent agenda item? School choice numbers. Do you want to talk a little bit about this? Yep. So yes. We, we have uh, we're part of the Winooski Valley Collaborative. I included in the packet the numbers that you'd approved for last year. Uh, I would suggest this year we're looking, we go instead of 50 to accept, after talking with Lisa, let's go with 15 on both ends. We'll let 15 out, we'll take 15 in. We have four in right now. We're not gonna get to 50 anyway. Be more realistic. So 
So when you're approving the consent agenda, the number that you're approving is 15 in and 15 out. Okay. Uh, the ADM stays with the district with, where the student resides. So when we send 15 students out, we still collect the ADM for those 15 students. When we take 15 students in, we don't get anything for them. Wow, we were, the 50 was just so out of step. Whack. With the other numbers, mm -hmm. other schools. Um, anyone have any questions for Michael on that? Okay, then I will entertain a motion for the whole enchilada. I'll move to approve the entire consent agenda. Thank you. W including the 15 for 15. Yes. Thing. Including the 15, in. Uh, the changes to the Winooski Valley Collaborative for accepting 15 students and allowing 15 students to exit. Okay, do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Sam. Further discussion? All those in favor, audibly, visibly? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Passed it unanimously. Thank you. Superintendent's report. You have a written superintendent's report that goes in depth. Happy to answer questions if you have them. Yay, Braintree School. Mm -hmm. Yay for a few of our teachers. We'll recognize. Mm -hmm. Again, thank you for the schedule. With the, the budget. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you for your superintendent's report. Um, negotiations. Negotiations. Dun, 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 dun. We need to get our we need to get our two committees together. I don't know if you want to do that right now. Pick a day and a time. Yep. Each of those committees, or if you want to do that after this meeting, how you want to. Let's take a stab at it. No, those should include Pietro. Correct. I don't think so. I think the first oh. one, the first meeting is just us. Is, I think it's just going to be you. Okay. And then you're going to decide whether you're going to use Pietro or not. And we can figure out ground rules and what your schedule looks like so we can reach out to the association and figure out. This will not include the association at this point. So it's just an organizing meeting for right. our negotiation committees, our board ones. Yes. Okay. So that's me you and Sarah. Mm -hmm. So let's me and you pick a pick a time. Is this worth taking time right now? Everybody looking at their schedules? Uh, I'm looking at my calendar. So it's helpful staff. for me. I'm just logging into the everything yeah. calendar. If I may suggest everybody look at that week of the second, just to try to get something on the I know we have an ends committee meeting in that week, but week of December second? better sooner than later and I don't mean to right because it would be nice if we've got meeting. budgeting to do to have maybe an idea well, oh Sarah's not on the hands committee but we could piggyback we could piggyback maybe she could could you do five is that Wednesday Wednesday I have yep. the voluntary faculty staff meeting before oh, that's before like so then maybe after. Sure. See if Sarah can do 6.30. Michael, does that work for you? Perfect. Okay, the professional staff negotiation committee will have an organizing meeting on Wednesday the 4th at 6.30. It's me and Sam. Who's on my And Rachel. And Rachel, is that right? Rachel mm -hmm. Fish or Rachel... Me. Gatis. Rachel Gatis. Oh, no, wait. It's Ryan. Thought so. Oh, Ryan. Ryan, me, and oh, Rachel Oh, no, it's Gatis. instead of Sam. Got it, got it, got it. Is this to be warned? Uh, the support staff? Uh, yes. Yeah, it's board business. So, so what are you looking at? 
Uh, I don't know. He's busy on Wednesday evening, so we, that one doesn't work. You probably, your schedule's probably hard to work around, right? Yep. What things would usually work, work for you? This is a really <laughs> quick one. Not to get into Tuesday. committee. Tuesdays Tuesday work for you? Well, Tuesday, well, that Tuesday evening, that week. Tuesday. Week, Tuesday evening. Ooh, that's my book club. Six to seven thirty. Is so it Tuesdays and Wednesdays? Otherwise, I'm late. I'm working late, or I'm, or it's Friday. What's our deadline of when do we want oh, this done by? Can we do it at five or five thirty? I can. Because my book club doesn't start until six. On Tuesday. Tuesday the twenty sixth. The no Tuesday the third of December. Yes, I can do that. Five. Especially if five. it's virtually. At five, we could do it virtually, or we could do it. Does yeah. virtual work yeah, okay fine. for you? Yeah, sure. Can do it. Virtual work for you? Yeah. Perfect. So We're support five. staff be five on December third. Perfect. So to clarify, I need to warn um, professional staff planning organizational meeting Wednesday the 4th at 6.30 yep. with a virtual option. Correct. And I need to warn support staff Tuesday the 3rd at 5 p.m. with a virtual option. Yep. Right. Okay. Thank you, Kyle. And to, dis and to discuss strategy and negotiations is executive session material. And yes. we'll go so into executive the session. The only thing on the agenda will be an executive session. Is that what is that well, what we'll be but doing, or will we're we not talking pro about negotiation? Kyle and I will build it. There'll be some executive session, and probably some that's not. Oh, okay. 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 That's, that's gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Awesome. Yay! Yay. If we're talking just about scheduling, then it doesn't have to be a public meeting. Like, if we're just talking scheduling, it doesn't have to be a public meeting. If we're we'll talking talk strategy and negotiations, then it's that part will executive be an, session. That part will be an executive session when you're talking strategy. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Gotcha. Little of both. It'll be a little of both. Sprinkle of both. Yes. Uh, school newspapers, principal reports. I newspapers, did I just say? I, I sent them as a link. To, I sent them as a link. Yeah. I think you read it, too, because I think you had some of my content, so that was great. Yeah. Or at least skimmed. Great. And hey, there's bingo this Friday night at RES. Only and, a dollar a card. And trivia night has been postponed, <coughs> so now you can do both. Oh. You have no excuse. Just saying, yeah. It just, has been? just right before I came to this meeting. So, oh. I haven't gotten the word out yet. Oh. Uh, so, postponed date wise yeah. to a different day? Yeah. Uh, okay. December 6th. Uh, <laughs> I can't believe I just put a plug in there. Please forgive yeah, me. I was going to say, just, okay. just so everyone knows, we're running some sales coming up. Yeah, <laughs> we're, just wear your gloves to a meeting, okay? Um, action item recap. So, any thoughts on a community letter just to tell the community what we're up to? Please send them to the Ownership Linkage Committee. Um, Ryan and Sam are your members. Your committee, please, as an action item, meet and come up with a proposal for how we might have how we might have an intentional conversation with the community having to do with the feasibility study. yeah would it be appropriate or okay with for us to do a little recap on that feasibility study in the letter um or? i think that you could propose that um, I think it would have to be very, this is my opinion, it would have to be very closely tied to an event where people could respond. I mm. think. So should we, yeah, should, think, should we just make the letter about. How the year has been yeah, thus far? Yeah, I, I or think, and a, or uh, the other way. I think uh, I just a. A, uh, an indication yes. that that some discussion is going to need to be had about that is how and that we'll be reaching too. out. These yeah. are like the letter is really going to look like. This is what we've been up to. By the way, this some, is some conversations coming. are going to happen soon. Please keep your eyes open. That kind of thing. Yeah, I, I think just to 
premonition of yeah. what's to come. You might direct them to the recording of this meeting. Mm. Yeah. I'd, yeah. Mm -hmm. People go cool with that. Mm -hmm. Rachel. Yeah. Okay. No, I'm thinking about I'm thinking about the um, the dialogue, like that there shouldn't be dialogue back and forth on emails about things because that's that's yeah. violation of open, yeah open meeting law. public information kind of stuff. Yeah. So, so work on something and bring it back to a public meeting. You got it. Ten four. Yeah. Okay. Um, do, 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 please look again at the first draft of the budget, come up with questions, um, you know, we're going to be looking at a second draft, just be in budget mode in your brain, things that you want to watch for. Um, Michael, you and I are going to meet and um, work on a letter to neighboring districts. Uh, and I'm going to email Sarah about the committee meeting we just scheduled. Those are the action items. That she's on the professional staff committee. Can I? I don't know if this is out of line or out of order or whatever, but just uh, a reminder for folks who are um, coming due to uh, their, their, election. Election. their election to, to mm -hmm. getting... Um, and do we know, so for example, I am coming due, I am planning on running again. I don't, I don't know if, do we know where Sarah is? Is she going to run again? Or do we want to be reaching out to the community in any way? Uh, I don't maybe know what her intentions are. I sent this week. Yeah. And so I have got so she's probably problem. thinking about it. Yeah. Signatures are due. Signatures January 11th. are due. January. I stopped for by Randolph. It's oh, the okay. end of January. It's January thirty yeah. first. I don't know what the other towns if they're. I it was a. I I I wrote it down on the paper and then didn't bring it with me. But um, I think. Or no. Oh, I don't even have my phone. I put it in my phone. But it's like the twenty seventh or something like that. It's, yeah. It's right around then. Randolph but says the 31st, but it had the wrong year, so <laughs> just, <laughs> I'm going to hand it in a little bit early <laughs> just to make sure. It's on the Secretary of State's website. It's a, it's a yeah. state, it's by state law, so oh. you can look up what the deadline is. Yeah. You know, whether she is or isn't, it doesn't hurt to be but talking about it in the community yeah, that this is an elected true. position and you know maybe you want to look at their vacancy yeah I, I think it's always worth talking about because boy it doesn't feel good to be like oh god racking your brain who who can we ask if they're interested in you know where can we find another rachel fish which isn't <laughs> the case but uh unless there is a need for an executive session that i'm unaware of I will make a motion to adjourn at 8.35. I'll second. Great. We're not voting on it. We're done. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we're supposed to vote on it.